In Jesus' name, praise God. Hey, uh, this, this evening or this weekend, there's a couple of things. Um, I, I just felt we needed to recap. Um, they say the percentage that we retain is not a great amount. And uh, the thing is, repetition sometimes is really good for us. Do you believe that? Yes. Because uh, the thing is, we've got to take the word and learn to apply the word in our life. And uh, if we don't do that, we just, uh, like it says, in, I think it's James chapter 1, where you, you look in the mirror and you walk away and you forget what you saw. Uh, and I don't want us to be like that. I want us to be people that know the word of God, know what the spirit of God is saying to us. And that we apply that and live that in our lives. And, and this year, I felt when I was praying that there was four themes that God gave me was rescue, restore, revive, and release. And uh, the thing is, I, I want to ask as a church, because each one of those areas is based on scriptures. Now, God is in, interested in that one lost sheep. Um, God wants to see people restored and made whole. Um, he hasn't brought us a point of salvation so that we can be about bless me, bless me. But God has given us this wonderful gift of reconciliation. If I ask you, any of you, I say, what does God want you to do? I want to be part of, and this is taking straight scripture, is the ministry of reconciliation. Each and every one of us have been commissioned by God to do that. Just as we look at the scripture in Matthew 28, where it says, go into all the world, uh, making disciples. It doesn't say a few, but all of us should be going and believing and looking at how we can touch people's lives for Jesus. That we would be like the, the good Samaritan, not like the priest or, the, or a religious person that sees a need and deliberately turns away um, because they don't want to get involved. It will cost us to be involved in ministry. Release is all about discipleship. And I want to tell you, the very beginning of ministry, you have to be born again. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Born again is the understanding that we, we come to Jesus with a new start. Um, and there's always things in our lives that we have to become aware of so we can make changes. Oh, I've used this illustration before. Uh, I remember one day I was ranting at Cheryl. Uh, we're newlyweds and, and uh, I was getting nowhere with my ranting and and, uh, and I felt God speak to me and he says you're just like your dad uh, not my spiritual dad my earthly dad uh, because I've heard my dad ran at mum and that never got him anywhere either and so I decided to do things differently and I, I'm not having a go at my mum and dad they, they did the best uh, as what they understood uh, but when God shows you things, then you need to make change. You need to do things differently because ranting and raving gets nowhere. Nor does nagging. The Bible talks about that being like a dripping tap. No, there's a dripping tap. Well, I hope it'll make you get off your backside and fix what it's, you know, whatever the drip is. <laughs> Hopefully that drip's not your husband or your wife. That's supposed to be a joke. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, and I've written down here, because um, I've, I've preached on those four points, and uh, what I've written down here is, I believe God wants us to be change makers. See, when you're born again, uh, we cannot, and we should not be the same. Now, I am not the same man as I was last year. I'm not the same man as what, what I was two years I'm definitely not the same man I was uh, 30 years ago or when I was first married Cheryl or even before that. I am not the same person because I have grown because I have endeavoured to grow. As a 15, 16 year old, I made a commitment that I wanted to learn by my mistakes. I wish I could say that every mistake I've made, I've learned by that mistake straight away. But some lessons I'm a bit slow at learning. But my endeavour has always been, God, I want to learn by my mistakes because I don't like going on roundabouts, round and round and round. And I don't like just enduring pain for the sake of it when I can make change and do it differently. 
Church, we need to have that as a desire in our heart. I also spoke about that we need to have a, a, a goal or something in our lives. And, and uh, one of them I put to you, uh, I'll put a couple to you, about having a holiday. And, um, how's your fun going for your honeymoon? Praise God. Praise God, that's good. Okay, the thing is that I also said that what about winning someone for Jesus? Now, unless we be purposeful about it, we will never ask someone that doesn't know Jesus. So I was talking to someone today. I've had a number of people say to me, I'm coming, but they're not saying when. I'm going to come. Well, I said, do I need to talk to you about Felix? And some of those others in the Bible said, where Paul was trying to win them for Jesus, and, and uh, their comment was, well, are you trying to convert me? Yes, I am trying to convert them. <laughs> yes, I am trying to get them right with God. Uh, and some of those that I'm reaching out to are being a little bit resistant. But my heart is that I want them to have an encounter with God that their lives will be powerfully changed. Uh, I've all written down here, unless you live fully for God, you are leaving room for the devil to mess you up or mess your will up, your emotions and your intellect. And those things will cause you to, those things to get in the way of serving God. Now, when we're not fully committed to God, we're leaving room for the devil. In Ephesians, it talks about leaving no room for the devil. I have used that illustration. Uh, when we um, leave room for the devil, it's like having a, a nail in our back and the devil can hang any, anything on that and that can become a hindrance. Uh, I don't know if you've smelt something dead, I think it was last week I said about my cat um, missing the um, um, cat litter box. Well, I hadn't lifted it up. Until I lifted it up, I nearly died. I, I nearly, oh, it just was so rotten. Um, the smell was mass. You know what I mean? And when I lifted it up, I thought, man. And um, then I didn't want to drip that rubbish, you know, the cat wee all the way out. What a mess! Mm -hmm. My cat litter is gone. My cat can go out that doggy door like like he used to. No more sucking. Time for him to. <laughs> you understand what like that smell? You imagine if you lay out a little nail on your back so the devil could hang. Now even though I've emptied. The thing, it's still stuck, hang, hung it on that nail, and you're walking around, and someone, whoa, what's that smell? <laughs> Instead of having a smell of life, you've got a, just a stench. So we've got to make sure we don't give any room for the devil in our lives. Um, because, you know, we've all got, probably you could say they're justified response to different things, but are they really justified? When we are dead in Christ. You hear what I'm saying? When we're dead in Christ. Um, the thing is, um, our emotions and our will and our intellect can mess us up at times. You know, sometimes we can feel justified by our actions or justified by our hurt when um, Jesus wasn't trying to justify himself dying on the cross. He laid his life down so that our sins may be forgiven. He didn't say, hey, intellect, saying, I know this is going to be painful. And I don't really, because he did ask God, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He did ask. He, he was fully aware of what was before him. And he said, God, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. Are, are we in a position that we can submit ourselves to Christ like that? God, even though I know this is painful, I'm not saying I enjoy pain. I like to just get pain over and done with. Now, if it's going to be painful, just do it quickly. Let me grin and bear it. I was talking to someone that was having a, uh, a hospital procedure, and I was just thinking, how painful would that be? And this is a grown man that just, you know, it, it must have been painful, and they're wanting him to do it regularly. And I said, poor God. And I said to him, it was me thinking, that I like pain done quickly. So how long does it take? At least 10 minutes, sometimes to a half an hour. Now I've got you poor, God, maybe you feel good. 
See, the thing is, pain is for a season, isn't it? True? It's for a season. Is he being holy? Yes. He's telling me, he's telling me that you're a pain. Is that what he's doing? Uh, no, I guess so. Okay, pain is for a season, correct? And the thing is, when you're going through those seasons of pain, what should we be doing? Shouldn't we be crying out to God and say, Hey God, I need you to strengthen me. I need, I need your wisdom to help me to cope, to work this through. Um, sometimes our intellect, our, our reasoning messes us up. And I've prayed with people that they're, where their mind just runs, 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 runs. And I reckon they must get exhausted. Because their brain, they overthink about stuff. And then you get some people who just don't think at all. I mean, you have the two extremes. But the thing is, we've got to, even with our mind, the Bible says, stay our mind upon Him. In other words, let's bring the Word of God into our mind and, and stay our mind on Him. So taking, the, not, not the natural way that the world thinks, but saying, hey God, I want to think in accordance to your will, your way, your life. Because I want to live my life to honour you. Um, look, I just want to quickly go through the personal thoughts that I've touched on. That we don't limit God when we put, by putting him in a box. But sometimes we think things are too hard or God, God can't do this. Um, some of you may have been believing God a little, for a long time. For someone to be saved, someone to be healed. For some change. Can I tell you, when you stop believing and give up, you won't have. I always say, while there is breath, there is opportunity. And, and the thing is, if I give up, I'm giving up on maybe something that God's told me to pray about and believe Him for. And if I give up, am I allowing myself to be sucked in by the devil? And I just want to encourage you, let's not uh, limit what God can do. Let's believe God for the more. Because I, I just, in my heart, I know God wants to do more than what we, we have. Um, we are called to be overcomers. And I've written down, I've winters, and when I wrote it, wrote it, I miss the H. Mm. Oh, well, you, you knew what I meant, didn't you? <laughs> winters, yeah, that's right. And sometimes we do win. Um, and I hear it at times, people whinging about God. Cheryl and I watched a movie uh, last night. We still don't have our TV working. It's been since... Our TV's working now. Yeah, now Fetch is not working, but we sort of got TV. So, and, and trying to watch TV is a bit boring. And someone gave us some DVDs to look at, uh, uh, Christian ones. One looked interesting and one didn't. One we looked at was um, no, the one about the Invincible or something like that. It, it was about a, a chaplain uh, who went to Af uh, no, Iraq, Iraq and, and uh, how he made a change in that company uh, that he was serving in, but he came back um, and it just messed him up big time and talked about the healing of his marriage. And, and how he reconnected with God. Great little movie. That was in the movies a couple of months ago that we long missed. Um, but it was a great story about someone in their journey you know, that did something wonderful for God, but on the way they, they got hurt and messed up and they lost faith and then to find faith again and find wholeness. It was a good story. Um, and, and I'm a team, that is real. Sometimes we think we're superhuman and stuff won't hurt us or harm us, but the thing is, church, we've got to always guard ourselves, we've always got to protect ourselves, because God has a plan and a purpose, and uh, we've, we've just got to always trust Him. Uh, I said, aim at nothing and you'll receive it. So let's aim for, for let's aim high, let's <coughs> believe God. Uh, let's, you know, believe God for more. And uh, I, I, I just feel in my heart we're going to receive. Don't live life with regrets. Can I let you know the secret? You can live life without toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
We, we had a pallet of toilet paper before last weekend. We don't have a lot left. I've actually put four bags in my office because we've got some for church. I've also got some masks that I've put in my office. I'm going to put some hand sanitizers in my office just in case something happens and God wants us out there doing something. I reckon that's just been wise. If we don't need it, it's fine. Mm. I've had come to you, see, I've had those masks for how long? long time. Years. How long have I had that hand sanitizer? Please. I don't think it matters. It's hand sanitizer. The thing is this, um, it's just been wise. And I think we need to be wise. Don't you? Yeah. So when you go to the toilet, you wash your hands well. Before you eat, you wash your hands. When you cough, you, you cough into your shoulder, you sneeze into your shoulder. If it's all gooey, you... <laughs> then you gotta go and wash your hands. <laughs> Look, I'm not gonna preach on this uh, tonight, but I will be talking about this, faith, hope, and love. Now, they, they're the glue that we've gotta have. And we've gotta live and do things God's way. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, there's a warning there that says, bad company corrupts good character. And it just says, stop sinning. Pretty simple, isn't it? Bad company corrupts good character. Mandy, what does that mean? Bad company corrupts good character. Tell me what that means. Loud voice. Actually, just stay away from uh, people that actually uh, don't understand what's bad in your life. Mm. And your past, but they come to the end of the past. Stand up and speak yeah. loudly. I <laughs> love it. It just means that uh, uh, allowing someone to influence God's plan in your life. Don't let evil influence evil. you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you can sit there. Thank you. <laughs> Do you agree with that, Klaus? Yeah, if I hang around the wrong people, the people especially in peer pressure. Okay, peer group pressure. Okay, so re really what it's saying, the Bible says that we should be the head, not the tail. Yeah. If you find yourself in a situation that you're the tail, you shouldn't be there. But you know, the thing is some people have good character and they have enough protection in their life that they can go to places that you cannot go to. There are some places I probably wouldn't go to now even. But um, it's like one time I was looking for someone that was missing and I went into, um, went into all of the uh, poker machine places in Deception Bay looking for this one person. I was surprised at who I saw in there. I was, I was surprised who I saw in there. Um, and actually, a couple of people said, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm looking for someone who's missing. I eventually found them sitting on a poker machine. That person can't afford to do that, but that's another story. But the thing is, I was not tempted at one way over to put a cent in that machine and pull that lead. Um, where if you have a problem there, you don't do it. I don't drink alcohol purposefully because I don't want people to use me as an excuse for them to get drunk or make poor decisions for their life, with their lives. Do uh, you understand all that? Yeah. So they're, they're important things, aren't they? So there's the warning, bad company corrupts good character. So uh, let's just think about it. Um, if you find that people are influencing you and they shouldn't be, you gotta make a choice. Got to make a choice. Um, and you should be prayerful that, that they shouldn't influence you, but you should influence them. Because the Bible's called us to be the head, not the tail. And I love it how it sums it up. It just says, stop sinning. If you're sinning, you need to stop it. 
Um, something I said to, with Pastor Margaret. Um, now there's times that I've counselled people and they've not listened to my counsel and they've done, done stuff. And I, I said to Pastor Margaret, maybe we need to tell them when they do that that they, they should not have communion. Oh, serious, if they're not prepared to, um, if they're not prepared to listen to godly counsel that's in line with the word of God, not that I'm trying to be legalistic here, but I want people to change. I want them to stop sinning. And the Bible says if we've got no plan to stop sinning and we keep having communion, what does that Bible say it brings to us? It brings judgment. It brings sickness. So do we want people that have judgment and sickness upon them? No, we don't. Uh, but if they're not serious about stop sinning, because communion is all about, oh, I don't want to stop sinning, I want to live out of the, the new life, that's my heart's desire. Maybe they're still battling with sin, that's totally different. But if we're deliberate in our decision to, not, uh, to keep sinning, we shouldn't do it. I'm not picking on anyone here. I've got no one's face in my mind, but I'm saying this in general because I want us to challenge people to grow in Christ. And, and I think that's a good thing for us to grow. Uh, you know, God uses people. Um, part of the wedding vows talks about you know, two couples coming together that are imperfect coming together as one. Now, the thing is, uh, I've had couples where they think they're going to change one another after they're married. There's no guarantee that anyone's ever going to change. Um, and I've also had where uh, a mother and father of the bride thought they were going to change the groom. Uh, there's no guarantee that's going to happen either. Uh, the thing is this, God uses imperfect people. Now, you say, oh, Pastor, you just challenged us about stop sinning. Now you're saying God uses imperfect people. Look, I'm fully aware that we are all sinners and we only become righteous because of having faith in Jesus. You need to understand that because our rightness is not because of our goodness. Our rightness is because of God's goodness. Yes, and we've got to be mindful of that. Um, since I'm picking on Klaus and Jenny, as you four can come and stand here, please. <laughs> the four of you. <laughs> Have you stopped sinning? No, I don't think I've ever stopped sinning. But are you still sinning, why well, when I say that, sinning deliberately? No. Because face the congregation. No. Oh. Don't they look handsome? Yeah. Or pretty? I don't know about class. <laughs> My last point here, or this, of this one here, is on unity. It's a oneness is something that we um, we have to want to be one as a church. You four are representing us as a church body. Um, now, if we're going to function as a church body and have unity of the faith, as it talks about in in Psalm uh, 133 verses one to three, it says, "Behold, how good and pleasant." It is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like precious oil that flows down uh, the top of Aaron's head right into his shoes. Now, to uh, understand that, that means if we're going to have unity, uh, we've got to guard that we don't have things that cause division. Correct? You guys are going to be here for a while, so just relax. <laughs> so the thing is... Um, What happens if um, what happens, Jenny, if you upset Kathy? I'll apologize. You're going to apologize. Yes. What if she doesn't accept your apology? Well, I just say, well, I'll apologize, and I still love you, and I just apologize. Okay. Okay. Now, I've never seen this of KJ. Apparently she has a fiery temper. A little one. She hides it. Well, I've never even seen it, okay? 
that I bet you if I ask Gavin, he's probably experienced it. Many times. Many times. <laughs> Just stay there, stay there. See, in Corinthians 1 verse 10 to 13, it says, um, this is Paul speaking, because what happened was uh, in the Corinth church, there was a group that different ones were baptised by different people, and they started saying, well, I'm of such and such. It's like uh, like in our church, so they might say, oh, I'm of Pastor Margaret. Oh, I'm of Pastor Ray. Oh, I'm of Pastor Dave. Well, that's the vision. And that's not what God wants. There should be division among us. In the scripture it says, uh, no division among you, but that you are... I can't read my writing. Something in the same, the same mind and same judgment. In other words, one in mind. Okay, one in mind and one in judgment. Now what did I say before? We have all been given the ministry of... Reconciliation. I heard that, Pastor Mark. <laughs> but you, the top mark. <laughs> that we all have the ministry of reconciliation. Now we all should have that as a one mind. So what is us as a church about? Being ministers of reconciliation. That we would reconcile the world back to God. One mind. Having unity. That that is what we are about. Seeing people. Going for that one that's lost. Okay. Now, I'm the fat one. You're the short one. You're the bright one. The cute one. The cute one. <laughs> and you're just plants. Okay, can I tell you, we're all different, aren't we? We're all not made from the same cookie cutter, are we? But the thing is, if we have the one mind that God is going to use us both individually and together to reconcile the world back to him. So God wants us to have this one purpose, this one mind that God can use us for his glory. Amen? So what I can do may not be what KJ can do or Marilyn. So we all have a different part to play. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about you know, we are one body. So in this case, KJ could be the foot, since we've been talking about her husband's toe. Marilyn can be, what do you want to be? The eyes? Yeah, because she's got issues with her eyes. You can be the feet. You can be uh, the mouth. What about the hands? Who can go be the hands? Well, she can be the hands. But now we all have different parts to play, and as we all play our part, we are about the ministry of reconciliation, making disciples, followers of God. Amen. So, when I get cranky and say, come with me, part of the body is missing. What were you? Toes. What was I? I'll say I'm a hand. Okay, so now you've got no hand and no toes. See, see the significance when we allow silliness to cause division. We can go down there. So we've got to work on having wholeness in our, in our lives. In uh, Philippians 1 verse 27 <laughs> says... Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So that means we're striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Come on, Klaus, you're the best mouth that we've got. Speak, brother. Oh, you're the best toe we've got. If we don't have your foot, we'll fall over. No, come on, foot, you, you've got to do your job. And we then we have different gifts given to us, no? gifts of the Spirit that God wants. Now, the prophecy, the prophet that speaks the word, no? some with the, the gift of healing. Now, the thing is this, uh, no, some people have different gifts on their lives. And let's be honest, we get envious when you see some people, you can get envious. True? True? We should be envious. If we have this revelation that we are part of a body, 
that's about the Ministry of Reconciliation. It's never about me. It's never about you. It's about us honouring God with our lives and what we're about. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stay there. I'm not quite sure what I finished yet. <laughs> okay, you can, go, you can go sit down now. <laughs> Okay, unity in, the, unity in the church, uh, I believe when, when we have that, there's a blessing um, put upon us. Um, and I, I, as I was thinking about that and thinking about the church in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, there was 120 people in that upper room. Started with 500, went to 120. 3,000 were water baptised on the day of Pentecost. Then it also says people were added to their number daily. Uh, then persecution came. You find Peter and John thrown in jail and, and they're having a prayer meeting that God would deliver them. And when they come on the door and knock, they didn't believe that they were there. Then persecution came uh, to the church after, after Stephen was martyred. And then what happened was instead of the church no, disintegrating it caused the church to spread like wildfire. And I'll tell you, there's things that, that happens in church life we don't understand. That's what I'm trying to say by this. Thing. There's things that happen that we just don't understand. But what we have to do is be very clear that we keep our mind and eyes upon Jesus. Because as we do that, we will have this wonderful revelation eventually and we'll look back and say, oh, I can understand that now. I couldn't understand that when I was going through that. But I can understand it now. When my dad was killed in the, the car accident, uh, one thing that I never asked was the why. Because I know in the Bible it doesn't say that God's going to answer our why. But what it says over and over again that I've got to trust him. I just say this to you. Um, now we, as a church, may not be perfect, but I want us to be one, and I want us to be about the ministry of reconciliation. And I am believing for that double portion. I am believing for the blessing of God. I'm not only believing for the blessing of God here in our church, but in the churches in this community. I remember when I was uh, pastoring in Gaither. And not much was happening in our church. And the Presbyterian guy told me uh, while we were playing tennis one Friday afternoon, um, four of us ministers would get together and have an hour of playing tennis every Friday or fighting. And uh, to rejoice with him that he had two people saved when nothing's happening in, your, in, in our church. See, it's about the kingdom. Amen. It's about... Rejoicing in what God's doing. Yes. Keeping our hearts right. Believing and trusting Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. I do have some other scriptures, but I'll stop there. Can we all stand, please?